Welcome back, Edgeteers. Today, I'm kind of taking the day off, just relaxing, enjoying myself. As you can see, I'm on my MacBook Pro, but I do want to talk about a Linux-related topic. I want to say right from the get-go, though, I know there are many of you who immediately, when you see a Mac desktop, you automatically say, oh, he's a fraud, whatever. This just happens to be the system I'm on. This is the one I'm working on, so this is the one I'm going to use. I'm sitting here in my easy chair relaxing, and I decided that I would register for the Red Hat Developer Program. So there's a couple of ways you can get there. One is from the Facebook page. If you click the Sign Up button, it'll take you directly to the Red Hat Developer Program, which is here. And what you can do if you sign up, you can get complete access to all of the software that's available on Red Hat. So you can do some experimenting and check out the different software that they have available. They have quite a lot. And you're, if you're interested in doing development in Linux specifically, it's worth looking at. If you're interested in server management, again, I do recommend looking at it. I always like to check out the latest and the greatest, and it's been years for me since I've looked at the newest Red Hat. So I thought, well, it's free. So I really like that idea. Before you had to pay to get into the Red Hat developer program, I believe. And Red Hat released an advertisement on Facebook that said, we heard you and we're listening, and now the Red Hat Developer Program is free. You can get access to all the software. So once you register, you get taken to this website, which gives you some information. If you scroll all the way up, there's a link for downloads, and you can get an idea of all the different stuff that you can download. Now, of course, they list the most popular, and the one that I've downloaded is Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, there's a new version called 7.5, so I was really interested to check it out. If you don't want to deal with Red Hat and you don't want to register, although I do recommend you do because you get the latest version that way, you can cruise over to CentOS.org, and they actually compile the source code for Red Hat from the latest version of the source code. Now, of course, CentOS is going to be a wee bit behind Red Hat in terms of compiling and making the binaries available for you, but they are currently on version 7.4. We'll cruise over here, and I'll just click alternative downloads to see what we've got. So, version right now CentOS is version 7 minor release 4 and I'm quite sure this is based on Red Hat 7.4 at any rate slightly older but you can still check it out but in this case I went ahead and downloaded the 7.5 release this is the Delta document for 7.5 so there's been quite a few features that have been integrated into version 7.5 now a couple of the things that they've done and I do recommend if you're curious about this go through everything but I know they don't list it here specifically but Red Hat Enterprise you gotta understand is a little bit behind the curve it's kind of like Debian very stable but not necessarily the latest version of everything because they want to remain as stable as possible so in this case, uh, the kernel is 3.10, but there is um, a kernel path upgrade that you can upgrade to a 4.14 kernel. So I read this on another site on Slashdot. Now, I'm probably not going to try it. The kernel is very custom. Don't think it's not updated with security fixes and all that, because it most assuredly is. I think that many people get nervous when they see the kernel version being literally one major version back, but it has almost all of the bug fixes integrated, but it's a very stable kernel version. You know, it's almost like thinking of the Mac ecosystem in a way, you know, or another flavor of Linux like Debian where they 
put this package together of all these different software packages and they want them to work perfectly together so they test and test and test and they are very reluctant to move up to new stable versions because at least initially they need to know that these packages are going to work correctly together so that's kind of the most important thing about Red Hat or one of these stable releases that come out from other distros like Ubuntu even. They have the long-term LTS release and that long-term release of course the whole point of it is these packages compiled together are very very stable and been tested repeatedly and we know they're very stable. You probably find the desktop most interesting, but if you're interested in development, you might want to look at compilers and tools because there's been quite a few changes. On the desktop, and this was somewhat surprising, they're actually going to upgrade the shell version of GNOME to 3.26, so they must think that it's very reliable. So they are bringing it up to 3.26. The settings daemon is being set to 3.26. LibreOffice is being upgraded to version 5.3. And, and here's a good example of how they can, how they basically upgrade, but they don't give the latest. LibreOffice is on version 6, but here we are with version 5.3. Uh, GIMP rebased version 2.822. Inkscape. 0.92 pretty old now I am a little bit surprised here Red Hat Enterprise 7.5 is gonna support live VA so VA API is an open source library that provides access to graphics hardware acceleration we talked about this with Red Hat excuse me <laughs> Fedora 28 so I'm very surprised to see this I think it's very interesting that they're gonna put something that new they're only on version 1.0 of the VA API GStreamer support supports mp3 the whole control center is updated 3.26 which makes sense and it goes on and on. They've really got quite a few things they've done here. So have a look at this document. I'll provide all the links in the video description. Now I've already downloaded Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's a 4.3 giga, gigahertz gigabyte file and it is an ISO and I'm going to go ahead and throw it in VirtualBox. Now, I've been talking with many of you about using ChemU and Boxes in Fedora, which I'm pretty excited to try out in Fedora 28. But for right now, I like using VirtualBox because it's so easy for me to move my virtual boxes from my different systems. I can go to Windows 10 or Linux or whatever. And I'm sure I could do that with ChemU, but I'm not... It's been, you know, wow, five, six, seven years since I've messed around with it. So um, I've got to get up to speed on that. So for right now, anyway, I'm going to use VirtualBox. I'm going to start with a new VirtualBox, and we'll call this Red Hat Enterprise 7.5. And seem to guess Red Hat 64-bit based on what I just typed in and we'll do continue now this particular MacBook isn't loaded so I'm gonna give it I think two gigabytes of memory should be sufficient um, let's see yes I will create a virtual hard disk and I am going to use the VDI. I will dynamically allocate it. And just in case I want to, you know, expand it in the future, I'm going to go ahead with 128 gigabytes, not 12,800 gigabytes. And I'll say create. So it's powered off. Now, as you know, once I power it on, uh, it's going to go ahead and ask me for a disk. I do like to look at the settings. Now with system, processor, you know, I'm going to go with a single core because I'm on a 13-inch MacBook Pro, so it really only has two cores. 
and we'll leave the execution cap uh video memory i'll boost that up to 128 megabytes one monitor scale factor uh enable 3d if it'll let me and i'll click ok and then start so it says the optical disk is empty so we will go to downloads and i'm going to grab our health server 7.5 Okay, so you have auto capture keyboard option turned on. Yeah, I know. Our options right out of the gate install Red Hat Enterprise 7.5 or test the media. If this was an official installation, I would most definitely recommend testing your media. I'm not too worried about it, so I'm going to go ahead and do the installation. If I wanted to go into production with this system, yes, I would definitely run a test. All right, we'll get rid of this message. We don't need it. I don't know how many of you have seen Red Hat lately. I bet many of my viewers use it on servers, or maybe they're using Ubuntu. Maybe we should take an unofficial poll. I mean, how many of you are using Red Hat? CentOS or some of the other versions of servers out there right now. Well you can see I'm gonna to have to scroll down here because I'm not getting all the way to the end of the screen. I suppose I could hide the dock. Let's see if that makes any difference. Dock. Automatically hide and show the dock. And let's see if we make this a little larger. That'll do. So this reminds me a lot of the Fedora installation. So I'm going to say continue. And of course it wants to know the installation source. And the destination. So I do need to select that. Again, just like with Fedora 28 and 27 for that matter, uh, it automatically selected it. So I'll click Done and then Begin Installation. Now I've noticed that the mouse is very, very, very slow uh, in tracking. So until I get the tools installed for VirtualBox, I think this thing will be a bit of a dog. All right, let's enter a root password. And done. We'll create my usual user. And you notice it's the older installation compared to Fedora 28. These options were no longer available in Fedora 28. You actually had to do it after the fact. All right, a quick password. And then back to done. So it's getting pretty close to being done installing. Okay, well, setup is all complete, so I'm going to go ahead and do a reboot. And let's see if it reboots without using the DVD, the ISO. Okay, so it did bypass the ISO DVD that's installed. It is booting up to 3.1. Now I presume the tools are now running because usually what happens is a, a version of the tools gets installed with the current version of VirtualBox and I just installed this so I should be okay. Okay so far we just have the text interface so we'll get logged in. Now I am curious if they updated to SystemCTL. Yes, I did say system CTL, didn't I? Well, <laughs> what I really meant was, uh, did they upgrade to system D? And the answer is yes, they did. I'm sure if you did version 6, it would not be. And as far as I know, they still update version 6. 
So let's look at how to change the host name. Set dash host name. Okay. Host name CTL set dash host name red hat. Cool. It's asking me to authenticate. I didn't issue a sudo. All right. So now if I do host name CTL, I am called Red Hat. So do I have an IP address? Command not found. Interesting. So I got a lot of work because I need to learn all the newer networking commands. I'm kind of old school still. Let's just try ping, see if we can ping google.com. No. Can we ping an IP? No. Um, can I start the GUI? Interesting. You know, this in some ways this reminds me of a BSD installation. This is very similar. Okay, using some help from Red Hat, there is a tool nm that is so strange. Whenever I leave after a few times of going back and forth, I leave the host. I have no keyboard. This is causing a wee bit of a problem. Let's reboot it. Let's see if I get my keyboard back. I'm thinking the desktop isn't even installed. Um, if I look at system CTL get dash default. Right now I'm in multi-user target, which is kind of like a knit level three, which is um, non-graphical interface with networking. So now we're going to try NM2E and let's edit a connection. So everything's automatic on configuration. I think I do want to do automatically connect and OK, then we'll go back and activate the connection. Whoops. OK, so theoretically it's activated. And we set our host name before host name CTL. Yep. Now let's ping google.com. Okay, we're in business. Whoops, don't want that. Hopefully we didn't just lose our, good, we didn't lose our keyboard. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it should be sudo DNF. Uh, let's find out what provides the GNOME desktop. Really? So we still are yum, huh? Sudo yum provides. So I'm going to have to slide back into older commands here. I don't know if this is going to work. Sudo yum provides gnome. Oh, I forgot all about this. So in order for this system to be able to get updates, it actually has to be registered in Subscription Manager. Okay, regarding the subscription, uh, Techmint here has a site. I do remember this command. So I'm going to type in this command and see if it still works. And I believe this information is referring to your um, subscription information on Red Hat. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now many of you are probably saying this is terrible. Don't ever use Red Hat if you've got to do all this stuff. What's the point of it? Well, I mean 
the point is that if you were running a server, this is what you would go through in order to set up and use the server as it's registered with Red Hat because the whole idea is you want the most stable server product that you can get. Now, I've used CentOS quite a few times, but we did have a large database server and we wanted to ensure that we had the most stable, reliable, in my opinion, Linux-based operating system there was, so we did put Red Hat on there. Other servers that were less important, we would use CentOS. Okay, so I needed to go to subscriptions, and then I went into the virtual system that I created under systems, and then finally subscriptions, and I attached the subscription. Once I did that, if I go back over here and do a sudo yum update, I can you can see now that I'm starting to pull in the update packages. So I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and do an update on the system. And then while I'm waiting for that, I'll look around to find out what the official name is for the GNOME desktop is, and we'll get that installed. Okay, so the update is completed. It was very, very fast. And I think before I do a reboot, I'm going to go ahead and do the yum group install server with GUI. And let's see if it installs. And there's all the packages that it will be installing. Curious. I guess I'll have to do skip broken. And we're going to give it the old college try and see if it works this time. Okay, so it looks like our skip broken switch did work. It's going to go ahead and hopefully do the downloads. You know, in thinking of it, I should have given it the dash Y, so it would have went ahead and did the updates right away. 684 megabytes installed size 2.1 gigabytes. And I will say yes. And this is going to take quite a while with a single core. So I'm not going to make you sit around and watch it, although it is cruising pretty fast, all things considered. So, so far we successfully registered for an account. We've got um, a subscription set up. We have updated our Red Hat. Oh, and we got networking working as well. And we did updates, and now we're installing the graphical interface. So very shortly here, we should have a fully operational Red Hat configuration. All right, updates are all done. It only took about 10, 15 minutes. Well, I shouldn't say the updates, the installation of GNOME. Um, I could change it so that it always boots into the GUI target, but I'm going to leave it as multi.user because really with a server that's the ideal scenario. Um, now if I do start X, I should get a GUI. Uh oh. Looks like X crashed. Server, server terminated successfully. Well unfortunately we had a crash. If I run this command <clears throat> uh, it looks like something is wrong with the drivers. I think we could try to install the virtual box drivers and maybe we'll get success while I still have a keyboard. Ha ha ha. Let's insert the guest edition CD. Well, the good news is I figured out what was going on with my mysterious 
keyboard disappearing issue. It actually was my fault. Um, the mappings I have set up for OBS are causing the problem. I'm using Control R to resume recording, Control S to stop it. If I'm in the virtual machine when I hit Control S, my keyboard is lost, but if I do Control Q, it comes back. So I've at least figured out how to get the keyboard back without having to re reboot. Yahoo! I hope this works. We'll make a directory called, I guess we could just call it DVD. And we'll do amount dev CD ROM space slash media DVD. And hopefully it'll mount. Okay, so it did mount read only. And it wasn't auto mounted, that's important to know. Uh, so we'll change directory to DVD. This is my thoughts. We should try to install the VirtualBox Linux edition and see if we can get better responsiveness uh, when we try to go into the GUI. I recall this being a problem back in the day, so... And we do have tab completion. And I did not see where it said it was uninstalling them. Okay, so the system is currently not set up to build kernel modules. Install yum, install gcc make Perl. whoops. gcc make Perl. And this is bad of me. I'm terrible. Kernel star. Just get her done. Install all the kernel packages. Make it happen. And we may or may not have to, we may or may not have to turn off SE Linux. So you can see it's a lot different running the Red Hat installation than it is CentOS or, well, CentOS is somewhat similar, but not quite as complicated because you don't have to register the system and have a subscription and all that stuff. But I think this is important to know if you're serious about um, working in the IT industry and you're going to manage servers and invariably you're going to run into a server that's running Red Hat at some point. And I always use Fedora on my desktop. It's just so much easier. As a desktop software, it's brilliant. I would be, I did use, I started using Fedora as a server back in the day when I was setting up servers, but I didn't like the mandatory, well, I mean, you did have a few years, but eventually you had to update your server, even if you didn't want to or you weren't going to get updates anymore. With Red Hat or CentOS, you knew you would be able to get updates. So like 7.4 of CentOS is good till 2024, I believe. I have to install Delta RPMs. According to this, it wasn't installed. So Delta RPMs basically is exactly what it sounds like. It looks at what's installed on your system and what isn't and creates a Delta so it doesn't have to re-download those RPMs if you already have them downloaded and installed, which makes sense. And I thought Delta RPMs was installed by default, but apparently not. Now I regret saying all of the kernel stuff. Hopefully things are kosher this time. So it did say it was installed before because normally the first thing it does is uninstalls the VirtualBox guest editions. This is encouraging, although I expect it to fail. Okay, well, kind of an odd thing here. It says that something went wrong, but it does say the guest editions were starting. So we'll just do a quick look. Make sure there wasn't an actual problem. Really, there may or may not be a problem. That make message, I really don't worry about. Tail minus 100. Now we know what we're going to tail. And pipe it through more. 
Well, I'm going to reboot, I think, before I try to run GNOME again. Okay, here we go. Probably won't work. Oh, bummer. All right, well, found some interesting things out. If I run the init space 5 instead of Stardex, I do get a GUI. But before I do that, I'm going to do a reboot. So if you look at these kernels, I wasn't paying enough attention. Uh, some of these kernels are the debug kernels, which I really don't need. So I'll probably uninstall those packages. But for right now, I'll just go with the selected kernel, which is not the debug. And I'm just going to do init space 5 and let's see what happens. All right, there's our GUI. By the looks of things, we do not have the VirtualBox guest editions running because the mouse is so sluggish. Let's see if we can snap the screen size. Uh, adjust window size. Yeah, whenever I can't adjust the window size, that indicates to me that the guest editions are not running. And we'll turn location services off. We'll skip accounts. And we'll start using our server. And this is the usual GNOME desktop help. But I'm going to look at display settings real quick here. See if I can change that resolution. No. So right now it's defaulting to 1024 by 768. The one thing that might be going on with the VirtualBox guest editions is that this is such a new version of Red Hat. So that may indeed be the problem. Now, unlike Fedora, look that they do give me the terminal command right there. I think I can get rid of kernel RT. We're actually running in it right now. I still am not sure what that RT is, but let's yum remove kernel dash RT. I don't think I have to type in anything more than that. Uh, we'll do kernel dash RT star and see what happens. Okay, so what I'm doing is downloading the guest editions 5.2.9 from the test build. So this is a very updated version of the guest editions and theoretically should be fine. This is version 5.2.9, so it is downloaded. Um, I could download, I could install the entire 5.2.9 virtual box, but I'm going to hold off on that and just use the guest editions. I found this tip for somebody who was having the same problem back when uh, version 7.4 of Red Hat was released. So we're going to try this again. And it doesn't want me to use that 5.29 version, so. guess it wants me to update the entire version there. Okay, we have 5.29 installed. Uh, I guess we'll start. Um, it should have the newest version of the tools, I hope. Okay, it's definitely newer, April 6th. Uh, the other one was in February sometime. Well, it looks like to me the uh, Red Hat 7.5 is just too new. And it'll probably be some time before the newest guest editions come out uh, that are actually working with 7.5. That's in general what I'm thinking is happening. I've pretty much exhausted everything that I know how to do. Okay, so even though I can't get the 
kernel tools installed or the guest editions installed figured we might as well take a look at the installation and I think the first thing I'm going to do is return it to 1024 by 768 all right let's go ahead and change this So we at least get a little bit more screen real estate. I'll try to go full screen so at least we can see everything that we're doing. And I just want to have a quick look and see what software is installed. Surprisingly, boxes. Now by default, it looks like, and it makes sense, LibreOffice isn't installed because this is really supposed to be a server. What's Tuna? Let's check it out. Really? I have to have root access to run this tool? Huh. What kind of options do we have? Not a whole lot. Okay, now I can see why they would not want this program to be run by a user because I can actually make changes to kernel scheduling. Interesting that IPv4 forwarding is enabled by default. You used to have to turn it on. It's pretty neat. I wonder um If monitor is installed, yes it is. How many cores does it think it has? Just one. A GUI software updater tool that just runs. I do remember this. Couldn't get updates, huh? I wonder what the problem is. Why it's saying I don't have my transactions complete. Let's try it. Nothing unfinished. So, and again, it, <laughs> it just goes right back to me saying I don't like the software updater GUIs. I think they're really not that great. I just prefer to use the command line because to me that works much better. Red Hat subscription information if I'm not mistaken yep also by the way I don't know if you know but you can actually go and do your subscription work on the website you don't even have to be at the servers or uh, secure shelled into them so you can do all of this from the website and if you have a cluster of servers or whatever you can just push out updates and do reboot schedules and pretty much anything you want to so to me it, you know whenever i've run servers it makes no sense to me whatsoever to actually have the gui running and it's downright dangerous because of the number of services that would be running. If we did a net stash dash an and we will pipe it through more. We'll look at everything that's currently running. And of course on a newer system there's going to be a lot more running. Now I'm, I'm hitting the space bar and going screen by screen here. And we go and we go and we go and we go. Must have been 20 screens. I didn't actually count. So I'm going to show you something that you can do real quick. I'll do an init 3. And that's going to bounce me right back down to the command line. And I will do login as me again. Let's do a net stash, net stat, a n, and we'll pipe it through more again. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So way less, way less. Um, I'll go, that was 14. We'll go back in the GUI. So 14 screens of ports and services. You know, in the good old days, and again, it does need to be configured and hardened. If this was going to be a server, we could get rid of most of the packages we don't need. Honestly, I bet if we removed the whole graphical interface again, it would be much, much less. But uh, netstat an pipe through more. Forty-seven screens of different services connected to different ports on the system. Forty-seven versus fourteen. Huge amount more. So stability wise, you know, it's gonna be great, but security wise, it's just not a good idea to run the GUI. Um, what I did do in the past with my servers was, you know, depending if, if I needed to have the GUI installed, like I had a third party software that was running on my server, I would go ahead and do that. And then I would take the GUI down. I would only do a NIT3 so that I didn't need the GUI. Now, if you're not familiar with the init levels, it's an older System 5. The newer way with uh, System D is a lot more complicated. It's just easier to type a NIT 3 and a NIT 5 and stuff like that. But uh, there's essentially six run levels. The ones that are most often used is run level 1, which is strictly single user mode, no networking. Matter of fact, we'll do that now just for kicks and giggles. And I think it's called single.user. Uh, but let's do a knit space one. And we'll give permission. And we have to type the password. Now, if we do netstat an. Oops. Forgot to include more. One, two. <laughs> two screens. So a knit one you can quickly go down to the next level. So uh, if you have a look at um, init tab, which isn't used anymore in System D, they give you hints. System D uses targets instead of run levels. So there's two main targets most people are going to use, multi.user and graphical.target, which kind of coincides with run levels 3 and 5. I think we're in single dash user system CTL get default. Let's try that. CTL get dash default. So it still says multi user dot target. Let's see if we have access to the internet. No. Um, so there, there may not be a single user anymore but rather multi-user without networking. And that's why we see so few ports running. And it's two and four are not used. And zero and six are reboot and halt respectively. So I believe if I do an init six, we'll find out. And it's six is reboot and it's zero is halt. And now I only have that one kernel. So we'll let it boot up and we'll try a net zero. So there really are not any run levels anymore. They're the target modes, but they still can be used. There's a script probably that simply runs the appropriate target mode. All right, so it powered off. It halted the system for us and went to the powered off state. Actually, I don't want to go to full screen this time. I don't know. Maybe I should have. Probably should have. So it just is more viewable for us. 
All right, whoops. Got to log in first, don't I? One thing I do like, if I don't do a sudo, it tells me, hey, you need, <laughs> you need to have permission, uh, root permission. So I just type the password in and it lets me do it. Okay. I wonder if they have in the tools here. Yeah, they do. Right here, firewall. And we can look and see where in the runtime configuration. DHCP client is allowed to communicate, usually SSH, but yeah. So this system could be a server, at least a secure shell server. Uh, if we wanted Samba, we'd have to set that up to open the ports and then install the services just like we did in Fedora 27. Some is the usual stuff. MySQL. Looks like Microsoft SQL. And then, of course, if you want it to be permanent, you click over to permanent, make your changes here as well, which they should be. Or you can just make your change in permanent. And I believe it's in options reload firewall D and we've done that so now if we go to permanent and we look at Samba and then cruise over to runtime it is now allowed but I'm going to go back to permanent And turn this off even though there's nothing to answer on that port because the service isn't installed and we will reload firewall D looks like you can also do runtime to permanent so if you have something running in runtime you can put it in permanent as well all right well that in a nutshell is Red Hat Enterprise 7.5 and it definitely took a lot longer than I thought it was going to take getting it all set up and installing it. But tonight I was just playing around anyway. And I'm just going to patch together. I got a ton of files, video files from this particular video tonight. But I'll patch them together. And if you're definitely interested in, you know, the more professional side of Linux, I do recommend getting set up for the developer and getting your free edition of Red Hat 5, or excuse me, 7.5, just so you can see what it's like and kind of walk yourself through the installation and the management of the server using the subscription management that's available on their website. It's actually a really nice tool. And have some fun with it and learn about Red Hat so that you have that knowledge set. I mean, if you think about it, if you've never done this before and you get that job and you're working in the industry, it'd be nice to be able to say, yeah, I do have that experience with Red Hat. It's good that you have experience with other versions of Linux, but the server side's a little bit different than the workstation side. And you could also use it as a workstation and increase your knowledge even more. Say, yeah, I do manage subscriptions, both a workstation and a server via the Red Hat subscription model and I know how everything works and how to manage these systems. Anyway, I think we'll call it a night. I hope you liked this video. It was more of a fun thing, so don't read too much into it. I kind of fumbled through because it's been a while. If you did like it, like, subscribe, and pretty please share. If you really liked it, drop me a comment. Let me know what you think. I'll see you next time. This video was made possible with support from viewers like you. 
If you find this video useful, consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com forward slash fast gadgets.